Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Locking Out a Congregational Church. This morning in our worship, we are going to start a new series of thoughts surrounding some psalms that normally don't get a lot of attention. These are known as psalms of lament or psalms of complaint, and it's really ways of expressing anger and frustration to God about everything that seems to be wrong in this world. I think that we're in a moment right now where a lot of us feel that way. And so I hope that as we sing and we worship, we pray and we praise, that we also can hold on to that tension of just not quite feeling right about stuff. Psalm 105, however, is a psalm that I hope we lean into as we express our thanks. The psalmist writes, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon God's name. Make known God's deeds among the peoples. Sing to God. Sing praises to God. Tell of God's wonderful works. I hope this morning we can sing praises to God and I invite you to worship with us. I invite you to pray with me this prayer of confession. O Lord, form in us clean hearts, pure in our devotion to you and your ways. May we join with others who praise you. And when we feel alone or overlooked, turn your face to us. Fill our mouths with songs of praise. Amen. I certainly hope that throughout this week, whatever hardships you've had to carry, you can lay down before God right now, that God can instead Turn God's face to you, that you absorb that sense of grace and mercy and compassion. And that in that awareness of God's presence in your life, you are able to pray to God. You are able to make your requests known to God. So take time now to make those prayers.
Together, let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever. Amen. We have a nice big salad bowl at our house. It's something we've had for 20 years. We got it when we first got married. And after that long of being used and put through the dishwasher and put away by the kids, we're noticing that there's some hairline fractures beginning to show up at the bottom of the bowl. It makes us nervous about continuing to use it, but at the same time, it's the big one. And normally if it's gonna feed the family, that's the one we need to use. It's hard to imagine that there will be a time when we have to let go of it, that it will be broken to the point where it's just not, no longer useful and we're gonna to have to throw it away. And you know, Psalm 73 works a lot like that salad bowl. It begins with a premise of truth, that God is good to those who are good. But as the psalmist looks around, they notice some cracks beginning to show that maybe indicate that that idea is broken, no longer usable. And it may point, at some point have to be thrown away. And so I want us to read Psalm 23 together. And I want us to be open to the disturbances we face when our faith begins to stumble. Truly God is good to the upright, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for they have no pain. Their bodies are sound and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not plagued like other people. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes swell out with fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against heaven. Their tongues range over the earth. Therefore, the people turn and praise them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Such are the wicked, always at ease, they increase in riches. And all in vain I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued, and I'm punished every morning. If I had said I will talk on in this way, I would have been untrue to the circle of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I perceived their end. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. They're like a dream when one awakes, and on awaking, you despise their phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was stupid and arrogant. I was like a brute beast toward you. Nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward, you will receive me with honor. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire other than you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Indeed, those who are far from you will perish. You put an end to those who are false to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge to tell of all of your works. And so when I look at that salad bowl, I think to myself, well, you know, maybe it's not that bad. Maybe we can still make some use of it. And, you know, I look around at this year and I think the same thing. Maybe it's not that bad. I mean, our country's been through worse, right? And my family's doing okay, even though everything is different. It's not terrible. But, you know, the cracks are starting to show. It seems that some of these have been there forever and have just been kind of holding on, some that I'm just now beginning to notice because I've had the privilege of just ignoring it, and some that seem to just crop up overnight and begin to spider web out, and it's uncontrollable. And so, you know, I look around at how the rich and wealthy in this country over the past six months have grown more wealthy, while many people are losing their jobs and losing their businesses and losing their dreams. And we've seen a spike in homelessness and depression among the people who are poor and marginalized, while the wealthy, the powerful, the protected are doing okay. 
And they can ignore all that. They can dismiss the protests and the calls for justice because it's not affecting them. And that's hard to, to imagine that something's got to give at some point. Something's got to break. And I can look around and say, is God good to the just, to the upright, to the righteous? Well, no. Like the psalmist, I can say, I see how there's lying bullies who look to be bulletproof. They can get away with saying and doing just about anything. The healthy stay healthy while the poor are wasting away. And the greed of those people who are in power turn them to violence, to justify killing and murder. And nothing can stop them. They become proud. They begin to mock God as they somehow show that their power and their wealth and all that they've accumulated in their life proves that they must be righteous, which means that those who are suffering now, well, they're forgettable, disposable. The psalmist will say that their eyes have become fat, they're ravenous to collect and to gain whatever they see, even if that means they have to ruin those who have virtually nothing. And then, to me, the heartbreaking part of this psalm is that the psalmist looks around at those who are oppressed, who are under the thumb of those who are wicked, and the oppressed cheer them on. They defend them. While those who are trying to do right, trying to point out the flaws in the system, trying to say this isn't how it's supposed to be, well, they're the ones who are rejected. He says, in vain, I've tried to do everything that's right. And it's as empty and meaningless as the size of exasperation every time I turn on the news. And so what do we do? Part, part of me thinks, should I even be saying this? Should I even have a sermon about this? I mean, isn't there enough misery to go around in the world that now on Sunday morning, I'm reminding you of it? Isn't this supposed to be a time when we should, you know, be happy and sing good songs and just disappear for a moment? Part of me thinks, why is this even in the Bible? Why would, why would someone want to write this down and stick it in there? And then why would people keep singing this song? I feel kind of foolish even for saying, you know, this isn't the only psalm like this. And we're going to read them over the next several Sundays. We're going to spend some time in that. In fact, when I tell other pastors what I'm doing, I get this kind of side look. Like, what kind of pastor are you? Don't you know that this is not what people need? But at the same time, I feel that it's there. It's there for us to read. It's been there for centuries. So maybe there's something valuable here. And maybe there's something valuable to hear when we look around and see things reflected in the words of this psalmist. He says, you know, I, it seems like I can't complain without getting beat up. And so I know what I'll do. I'll just be quiet. You know, I've been taken to listening to, you know, some Rage Against the Machine in the van with the kids, and maybe I've got to stop that. Maybe that's not the best way of expressing my frustration with what I see around here. And so I'll just put my headphones in, and I'll be quiet. And like the psalmist, it feels like my foot slips and begins to move away from this faith that I held on to so closely. And I begin to feel alone. Adrift, confused about how do I answer the questions that people bring to me about where is God in all this? When I look around and I have the same questions. When the Bible has these same questions. And so the psalm takes a turn. When the psalmist writes, I found myself in the sanctuary. Almost like it was a surprise. Like his feet took him there without him really intending to go. I imagine it's a lot like some of us who go to Christmas Eve services just because our family expects us to. And we don't want to go. We don't want to sing the songs. We don't believe the stories. But we do anyway just to avoid a fight. It's tradition and, you know, we might as well. But I'm not going to sing. And I'm not going to pray. And I'm not going to just plaster on a happy face. And I hope people notice I hope people see that my silence is my protest to say that I don't buy into any of this anymore. 
I think that's what the psalmist was doing. But then, surprisingly, the songs and the stories and the memories built within that sanctuary, within that moment of worship, come to him. He says that, I realized that it was their feet who were standing on rocks that's been slicked by the waters of the Red Sea, that they did not cross in time and they will be destroyed. The echoes of this story of, of exodus and exile and of God arriving when it looked like God was as far away as possible. He realizes he's a part of that story. And I think that in the moment, as he saw the waves coming toward him, he realized God can save me. God will save me because God has. And I think that these stories that we cling to, the ones that, that give us the resolve to keep moving forward, to remind us that it's okay to cry out in frustration. You, you know, for me, the fact that Mary and Martha, when Jesus comes to town after they buried their brother four days ago, and the first thing out of their mouth is, where were you? You knew. And where were you? And then Jesus promises that Resurrection and life are possible. Or when Peter, after saying something stupid and ruining a friendship, finds himself going back to fishing and leaving the faith altogether, only to see Jesus making breakfast on the shore so that he jumps out of the boat and swims. You know, even stories of, of Samwise and Frodo who find their conflict and betrayal it forces Sam to leave. But then he comes back when Frodo needs him the most. As he's about to be taken by Shalab, Sam steps in and becomes the hero and rescues his friend. Even George McFly's right hook in the face of a bully to stand up against fear and concern and turn himself over to whatever has to be done to be right. These stories matter to me. And I think you have your own stories. I'd like you to think of those stories either those in scripture or, or, or books or movies, but the ones that remind you that there is good and there can be. And that even in the midst of everything going wrong, we're part of a story that God is calling us to embrace, to engage with. And, and, and when we do that, we gain a perspective that reminds us that we are not in unknown territory. Every person who has put a pen to paper to write a story of fiction or of truth that reminds us of this deep truth that this is what life is about that we fall and we stumble and we doubt and the cracks begin to show but God's faithfulness reached back to them in the past and so maybe God's faithfulness can reach to us right now we're invited to discover a new way of trusting a new way to have faith the psalmist says you know what I was petulant and stupid God never left. I yelled at God. He didn't yell back. And when I decided to be silent, God wasn't. The remainder of the psalm is filled with reversals. It's a theme that is throughout scripture, a sign that God is able to write what is deeply wrong in the world. He says that they're, they're, the people of flimsy faith can find resolve. That the greedy are going to lose it all. That the voiceless learn to shout praise for God's salvation. And that those who have found a numbness in their soul can discover passionate hope. And so at the end, he says that the sanctuary has become his refuge. Not as a place to hide away from the world, to ignore the pain and the injustice and the wrongness of everything. But it seems that the psalmist is saying that the sanctuary has now become a place where he can rest and be restored and go out and see the world as it is and still know that God is there. That God was in the sanctuary with him. And that God's going to leave the sanctuary with him too. That God will carry him out. This is a psalm, ultimately, that calls us to trust that doubt can be the means of a renewed faith. That we can witness injustice and not excuse it. In fact, this psalm shows us that we can see the pain of this world and we can point at God and say, why don't you care? And so I know that at some point in the future, my salad bowl is going to break and I'm going to have to get a new one. 
or maybe stop eating salad. And I know that at some point, the faith that I have is going to fail. That my experiences and all that I witness is going to crumble. And I'm going to need a new faith. One that makes room for the new perspectives from all the cracks that I've seen. I've had my moments when my faith was not enough. And God never left me. And I hope that you can look back on your life and say there were moments when it just seemed that there was no way forward. My foot was slipping. I didn't know what to do. But God was there. And so I want you to find encouragement in a psalm filled with discouragement. I want you to find solidarity with saints of the past who have penned these words to remind us that we are not alone. That this is a human experience. And that in this human experience, this is sometimes the means that God uses to draw us closer. So I want you to imagine how God might use this moment of all the weight that you bear right now as a way to bring you closer to faith and hope, to love and compassion and forgiveness. May you find these gifts in the name of Christ. Amen. Falls. I raise my hands, I praise the God who.
Sometimes the night is beautiful Sometimes the sky was so far away Sometimes it seemed to stoop so close You could touch it but your heart would break Sometimes the morning came too soon Sometimes a day could be so hard There was so much work left to do But so much you'd already done Oh God, you are my God And I will ever praise you Oh God, you are my God And I will ever praise you And I will seek you in the morning And I will learn to walk in your ways And step by step you lead me And I will follow you all of my days But never beyond your reach Oh God, you are my God And I will ever praise you Oh God, you are my God And I will ever praise you And I will seek you in the morning And I will learn to walk in your Each morning we are invited to seek God. Each morning we have a new opportunity to follow God in all of God's ways. And sometimes the best act of faith is just taking the next step, knowing that step by step God will carry us, God will lead us. I hope that this morning, as you've held on to both praise and lament, you can find that God still carries you, still shows up, still listens when you cry out. Amen. <laughs>